My name is Bob Bingham and I study climate change and interpret how it affects the world. I have a website called Climate Outcome which explains the various aspects of climate change, particularly in relation to New Zealand. This presentation sets out to explain the natural cycle of the world's temperature through ice ages and warm periods so that with a bit of background knowledge you can see where the planet is differing from what, be what would be considered normal. Global warming is a term used to explain how the whole planet is warming due to the big pulse of CO2 we've put into the atmosphere. But in previous ages there was a natural cycle between ice ages and warm periods. This presentation sets out to explain how the repleting mechanism of, of the natural cycle and how we have moved in and out of ice ages and warm periods over the last million years. This is the famous blue planet picture taken from space. There's possibly no other planets with the amount of liquid water that we have. Our life is dictated by the temperature boundaries of water. Water freezes and becomes solid at zero degrees centigrade and it boils at, into a vapor at 100 degrees centigrade. We live very comfortably at an average temperature of 14 degrees centigrade and this temperature was taken from space and it can evens out the local effects of weather and uh, day and night temperatures. This is how an inquiring mind starts scientific inquiry. Thomas Jameson looked at the valleys in Scotland and noticed that they were the same as those in Norway which had been shaped by glaciers scouring the sides. From this he worked out that Scotland had once been covered in ice. So that by around 1870 people understood that we had had ice ages in the past and that ice covered much more of the earth than it does now. Everyone now understands that temperature is cycled over the centuries. The blue graph at the top is the EPICA, uh, the European Project for Ice Coring in Antarctica, a research team's record taken from the ice cores reaching back 450,000 years. And the green graph below is the Russian version from Vostok, which is also in Antarctica. The red graph at the bottom is a record of ice volumes, but it could just as easily be level, labelled sea level height, as when the ice melts, sea levels go up, or conversely, when the water freezes, sea levels drop. I just want to draw your attention to the range of temperatures in the solar system, just to illustrate that there are much bigger temperatures at play compared with our normal life. The difference in temperature between our nearest planets is not the distance from the Sun, but the density of the atmosphere due to their gravitational forces and the amount of water or CO2 in their atmosphere. Venus, which is the second planet out from the Sun, has a dense atmosphere that is 96% CO2 and a temperature that will melt lead which is at 461 degrees centigrade. Earth is the blue planet and our atmosphere consists of 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 0.93% argon and this amounts to a total of 99.964% of the atmosphere. This leaves a small amount for other gases, including CO2 at 0.035%. And, and just to mention it, Earth's temperature is 14 degrees centigrade. Mars has a very light atmosphere, but although it is 95% CO2, it has very low gravity, and, and this results in a thin atmosphere, and therefore it cannot retain heat. Mars has an average temperature of minus 46 and it goes down to minus 73 C at night and at that temperature water is frozen solid. Just to complete the picture uh, with temperatures, the Sun's temperature is 5750 degrees centigrade and space is minus 273.15 which is the theoretical minimum temperature. Right. This illustrates the relative size and influence that Jupiter has on our planet. Earth is the little blue one in the front row. You can see the relative size between Earth and Jupiter. 
Milutin Milankovic uh, was an Austrian mathematician who produced a paper in 1912 which explained how the elliptical orbit of the Earth interacted with the elliptical orbit of Jupiter to cause an ice age. He could show mathematically that it was a recurring event. In a very simplified explanation, Earth goes round in the Sun in an elliptical orbit, and so does Jupiter. Jupiter. And about every 125,000 years, we get Earth gets closer to Jupiter. The powerful magnetic force of Jupiter hurls the, hauls the Earth over sideways to increase our angle of tilt from 22.1 degrees to 24.5 degrees. This tilt action is very slow and happens over f about 50,000 years, giving plenty of time for the effects to take place. This is the summary of Milankovitch's calculations. Uh, the top graph, the top blue graph, shows the degree of inclination of the Earth as it comes close to Jupiter. At the very bottom, you can see the ice ages and warm periods and how they are closely synchronized. Now that we have computers and satellites, it's all been verified and found to be substantially correct. As the Earth tilt tilts over, it exposes more ice on the poles to the Sun. The normally reflective polar ice melts, exposing the sea. Heat is absorbed by the darker oceans, releasing CO2 and methane, and the Earth starts to warm up. The melting of the tundra releases millions of tons of methane, which is 72 times stronger than CO2 over 20 years. The tundra and oceans also re release CO2. A combination of all the greenhouse gases warms the planet further with a repeating self-perpetuating mechanism, which is, then, which is called climate forcing. This slide illustrates the relative heat absorbing or reflecting characteristics between bright ice and the blue ocean, or for that matter between snow and brown green soil. Bright white ice reflects 85% of the sun's heat back out into space and the dark ocean absorbed 93% of the heat, so there is a very big difference. The temperature records now stretch back nearly a million years through about 10 or 11 cycles and it follows a regular pattern. A noticeable feature is that from the peak of a warm period the world's temperature drops slowly over thousands of years with many temporary reversals before the minimum of an ice age and it then rises steeply in almost a single stroke. This is where we are today. The tropics of Cancer and Capricorn where the sun is directly overhead at midsummer, are at 23 and a half degrees. And this compares with the previous illustration of a maximum tilt of 24 and a half and a minimum of 22.1 degrees. We are currently on our way to being more upright and the planet should be cooling. This is the temperature reconstruction of the last 11,000 years, which is roughly the Holocene era, and is roughly the period of recorded civilization. When I was a young man, there was a recurring theme in newspapers that we were entering a new ice age. It's a reasonable enough assumption, but only half the story. These are the current temperature records taken from thermometer readings. It's not an easy, an even increase because there are on, we are only measuring the, the temperature of the atmosphere and 93% of the heat is stored in the oceans. The oceans go through stages of absorbing heat and then releasing it later. Uh, it's all to do with the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. The centre of the graph is about 1940 and you can see that we had entered a period of pause and the world's temperature did not continue its upward path until about 1960. We then had a strong burst of increasing temperature which alerted the world to the problem of global warming and kicked off a lot of research into the subject. We are currently in, in our third pause while the oceans uh, readjust the heat. Why is, it, why is it then that when the world was cooling in its natural cycle, the temperature has suddenly started to increase? First, we'll take a quick look at the atmosphere to give some background information. 
We live in the warmer and denser part of the atmosphere, which is the golden section and is known as the troposphere. The troposphere is roughly 10 kilometers thick, or about 10,000 meters, compared with the diameter of the Earth, which is 12,500 kilometers. If we re reduce the scale of both dimensions, which are in kil kilometers, down to the equivalent in millimeters, then the Earth's diameter is 1,250 millimeters, and the atmosphere would be one millimeter, roughly the same as a coat of varnish on a football. Whichever way you look at it, it's very, very thin. To bring our habitable part of the atmosphere into perspective, the temperature reduces with altitude at the rate of 7 degrees centigrade for every 1,000 meters of height. The temperature, if the temperature at sea level is 14 degrees centigrade, then at 2,000 meters the temperature would be zero or freezing. The tree line is at approximately 2,000 meters and all of us live well below that, mostly below 1,000 meters. So we live in a very small habitable region of the atmosphere. There are many illustrations like this produced by different scientific institutions. With the use of satellites, scientists were able to, are able to measure the heat coming in to the Earth um, and just as importantly, the heat that is leaving. The sun's radiated heat hits the top of the atmosphere at 341 watts per square meter, and around a third is immediately reflected back into space from the tops of clouds and from ice. Moisture in the atmosphere plays an important part, but also a very complicated part, with clouds reflecting heat back out into space to keep us cool, but also clouds trap heat to warm the atmosphere. And moisture is also a greenhouse gas. Eventually heat is radiated out into space and what leaves should be equal to the amount of heat coming in to maintain a stable temperature. What is really important here is that there has to be a balance of heat entering the system with the heat leaving the system or there will be a temperature increase or decrease. Currently there is an imbalance of 0.9 of a watt per square meter, which is the additional heat trapped by greenhouse gases. If we had no greenhouse gases like water or CO2, we would be 37 degrees cooler and the, and the world would be a f frozen ball of ice. Okay, now I, I just want to deal with greenhouse gases and, and the way they work. Um, Svan Arrhenius discovered that CO2 was a greenhouse gas back in 1896. So it's not a modern theory, and it's part of the natural property of gases. This is a very simplified explanation of how a greenhouse gas works. The surface of the, uh, of the sun is 5,750 degrees centigrade and radiates light and heat at a wavelength of 500 nanometers and, and this will pass straight through the greenhouse gases of water, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide and ozone. The temperature of the surface of the earth is only 14 degrees centigrade, centigrade and radiates heat out at 1500 nanometers, a much wider wavelength and this will not travel through the greenhouse gases so that the heat gets radiated back and forth, warming the atmosphere, before it eventually escapes into space from the top of the atmosphere. This is an illustration of the same information showing the wavelengths of the various greenhouse gases, which are all slightly different. At the top, red is the incoming heat from the sun and blue is the outgoing heat from the earth. In the second row down, the dark sections are where the heat wavelengths are restricted and the white sections are where the radiated heat can pass unrestricted. In the lines below, the different properties of the various greenhouse gases combine to block whole sections of the wavelength spectrum. It's the combined physical properties of all the gases that keep us at an even temperature of 14 degrees centigrade. 
Greenhouse gases warm the world, but there has to be a mechanism for cooling the Earth as well, or we would slowly overheat like Venus and we would not have any ice ages. This cooling is done by the plants and the ocean plankton. This is a very simple chart of the Great Ocean Conveyor, which is a very important part of the world's temperature and health. It distributes heat around the world and it soaks up CO2, which it conveys through the oceans in a delayed time lag of 30 years or more. In very simplified terms, CO2 is absorbed into the Gulf Stream as it cools and flows towards the Arctic region, where the seawater eventually sinks and disappears into the deep oceans. The CO2-laden cold water resurfaces again at turnover points in the Antarctic Ocean and in other places. CO2 is a gas made up of one carbon molecule and two of oxygen, and this is the main gas that we are interested in. When the water in the deep oceans finally surfaces, it comes laden with nutrients and CO2. As this very cold water starts to warm, it releases the CO2, and this with photosynthesis is taken up by the phytoplankton, and they consume it and split it into carbon for their structure of their bodies, which is calcium carbonate, and they release oxygen into the atmosphere. The phytoplankton are the base of the marine food chain, and at each level, creatures die and the carcasses sink to the bottom floor of the ocean floor, locking up the carbon. This happens in vast quantities and locks up massive amounts of carbon on the seabed, and it also makes 50% of the oxygen which we breathe. Every second breath, breath that you take has oxygen supplied by the phytoplankton. A similar process happens on land where a plant absorbs sunlight, CO2 and nutrients. This photosynthesis in, in the leaves splits CO2 to make carbon in wood and make oxygen for the atmosphere. When the tree dies, the wood, which is largely carbon, is retained in the soil. If left long enough, the wood would become coal. This previous slide described how carbon is locked up but it can also be released. Take carbon and burn it and add CO oxygen and you get CO2. Burning fossil fuels produces about 32 billion tonnes of CO2 a year and puts it into the atmosphere. Every tonne of coal burn produces three tonnes of CO2. CO2 and temperature move together very closely. It's not easy to see but the normal temperature of the Earth is about 5 degrees centigrade cooler than today, and the CO2 levels range between 180 parts per million, million and 280 parts per million. The Holocene period in which we, which we are now it <clears throat> is the little red squiggle on the upper right hand of the graph, and the vertical blue line on the extreme right is the current level of CO2, not yet followed by the red line, which is the temperature. CO2 is now at 400 parts per million, which the world has not seen for 4 million years, and the climate has not yet caught up. But it is moving faster than anyone predicted, and the next 30 years could be very testing. That's a very quick overview of how the repeating pattern of ice ages and warm periods happen, and just a hint of where we are going wrong.